Crossing the utmost northeastern border of Iowa, you'd be hard pressed to believe you're following one of the longest rivers in the world. Between the captivating rolling bluffs and the peaceful surroundings of New Albany, there is faint evidence of the Mississippi River's presence. And yet, for thousands of years, vast stretches of the Mississippi looked like this. Shallow pockets of connected running water covered by trees, which are camouflaging the greater channel from easy viewing. Long before New Albin was even a thought, or the pioneers who settled this land even existed, this slough was simply habitat. Trees, calm waters, and thousands of native or migrating fish and birds. Today, this scene still exists, but with one major addition, man. We have greatly altered the Mississippi ecosystem from towns and roads to dams and barges. The 21st century Mississippi River is an entirely different experience for the area's original inhabitants. Funding for Iowa Land and Sky provided by the Gilchrist Foundation, Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. The Resource Enhancement and Protection Conservation Education Program. Just south of New Albany is the eye-catching town of Lansing and its Black Hawk Bridge. Built in 1931, the unusual design bridge is the first available crossing to drive between Iowa and Wisconsin. And at sunrise, it is a magical sight to behold. As the sun climbs into the sky, Lansing comes alive. With its hills illuminated and its channel bustling with barge traffic, Lansing is clearly an eye-catching town. However, these bluffs are more than just a picturesque home to our northeastern neighbors. No, the cliffs and mounds of Lansing and Alamakee County provide the perfect habitat for one of Iowa's most wondrous residents, the Peregrine Falcon. <laughs> a big part of the comeback of the Peregrine Falcon to these river bluffs is the release that Bob Anderson and the Raptor Resource Project did 20 years ago. And of all places they picked was Effigy Mounds National Monument, where there's peregrine falcon effigies there and walking bears, just the, the you know, historic significance of that. And that's an interesting story in itself because when peregrine falcons were raised and released initially, they're released from the tops of buildings and grain buildings and power plants and things like that. It's kind of a stepping stone to get them out back here in their, their, their iries on the river. Well, they didn't do that. This historic release back in 1998 and 99 was to release them from rock-lined hack boxes at Hanging Rock there in Effigy Mounds National Monument. And they fledged from that, and I think it was a year, two years after that, they started showing up in the historic iries. When the release happened at Effigy Mounds, 98, 99, there were no falcons on the cliffs. And, and so it's a brand new population. So we start banding that new population, and now it's been 20 years, so it's a matter of consistency, as, especially as the population continues to grow. Of course, in order to monitor the falcons, they first must be reached, not for the faint of heart, the best way to reach the cliffhanging falcon nest is repelling from above. An arduous task, but a safe one that members of the Raptor Resource Project are trained to undertake and look forward to year round. We're at Lansing on Guider's Bluff today, and there's a nest box on it, so that's easy to find. Uh, you can see that just as you lean out over the lid. Sometimes you can't see uh, the hole from the top, so we have to go down a ways. Today we had four, uh, and I couldn't even tell there was four until I got into them. They are under 10 days, you know, maybe nine days of age. We want them at least 13 and preferably closer to 20, and that's because the bands have to fit their legs, and their legs aren't fully grown yet to put the bands on. So this is a very productive site. At the same time as the Effigy Mounds release of 1998, peregrine falcons were taken off the federal endangered species list. While in the early 70s, falcons were near extinction, today they are considered to have a stable population. 
Still, the animal's fragility helps researchers understand the ecosystem as a whole. While they recovered from extinction, there's still sort of an important sign of what's going on with the ecosystem. We're also collecting longevity data on them and we're learning more about them still even now. How do they act? What do they eat? What do we see? How are they responding to springs getting earlier or springs getting wetter? Peregrine is the Latin word for, for wanderer and that's what they do. They cover a lot of territory and it's one way to see how they disperse once they do leave uh, the nest site. Today, peregrine falcons are a staple of the upper Mississippi region, where Lansing and surrounding communities celebrate the bird, with annual banding events being a point of pride. Everybody loves to see the peregrine falcons and, and band them each year, and it really is kind of a tradition. Uh, people will bring their kids each year just to see that and connect and see those young peregrine falcons. So it really, you know, banding and doing this, I think, has a lot of value. Lansing is only one of dozens of towns whose topography and climate provide the perfect habitat for birds of prey such as the peregrine falcon or American bald eagle. Commonly referred to as the Driftless Region, Iowa's northeast corner is like few places in the world. Home to scenic treasures such as the Upper Iowa River's Chimney Rocks, the Driftless area is unlike anything else in the state thanks to time and geologic luck. Stretching from the rolling mounds of earth of New Albin, all the way to rocky outcroppings of Bellevue, and as far west as Fayette and Cresco, Iowa's Driftless Area is actually one of Iowa's seven different landform regions. The geologic name for the area is the Paleozoic Plateau, as the last time it was glaciated was more than 245 million years ago. The true Driftless Areas, untouched by glaciers, lay on the eastern side of the Mississippi. For evidence of the plateau's glacier past, look no further than the uniform height of practically every hill in the region. Encapsulated by driftless mounds, the Yellow River State Forest is a haven of fishing, camping, and backcountry backpacking. It also is home to Iowa's only fire tower. Erected in the 1950s, the tower is a picturesque 100 feet high and should stand forever as it is a national historic landmark. Hard to miss, one of the most abundant features of the Paleozoic Plateau are rock outcroppings. Besides drawing in the eye, many of these outcroppings are home to a geologic phenomenon truly found nowhere else in the world. Known as Algific Talus Slopes, Many north-facing hillsides in the region secretly hold networks of hilltop rock spouts and interconnected tunnels of ice and water. While not necessarily easy to find, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has mapped virtually all of them and protects them against development. Right now we're kind of standing on a um, allergific talus slope now. And it's, it's, this was kind of not as impressive as, as the one we're going to go to, but it's... Uh, it's basically, you can tell it's more, it's the rock, the talus type rock, the slope and everything. And so it's actually, here's, here's a crevice right here behind us. Well, so you have these holes in the middle of the agriculture are filled on top of the ridge and they feed or feed down through the, the rock and there's frozen ice or water. And then it freezes in the winter and then all during, through the summer, it'll stay out and um, it'll kind of fall, create this, this really cool microclimate right at the, right at the mouth of the hole, the vent. And that's what creates these special isolated habitats or microhabitats for the monkshood. It's all coordinated together, and, and they only exist on these these algebic talus slopes. So it's um, it's really unique in the world, and it's specifically unique to Iowa. These enigmatic systems produce cold air and water year-round at their lower events. Hence, algebic, meaning cold-producing, and talus slope, which refers to stacked broken rocks on a ridge. A handful of Iowa locations, including Bixby State Preserve in Edgewood and Ice Cave Hills Park in Decorah, have visible examples of this phenomenon. However, it is very likely nearly any north-facing slope in the Driftless area is home to a subterranean network of ice caves. The Mississippi represents one of the most diverse ecosystems in the state of Iowa. And from New Albin south to Keokuk, much of the river is cared for by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 
Spanning more than 150 miles, the Upper Mississippi River National Wildlife and Fish Refuge is one of the most scenic corridors along the Great River Road. Working with supporting organizations such as the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and the Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service maintains and restores the river's vital habitats, benefiting both man and animal. So we are in um, Pool 9 of the Upper Mississippi River, and we're actually at what the project that was completed called Harper Slough uh, Habitat Rehabilitation Enhancement Program. And it's monies that get used uh, to help with mitigation from the lock and dams that were placed back in the 1930s. And so this project was started uh, about five years ago, and it was completed construction-wise uh, last year. And today we're out here kind of tidying up things and doing some tree plantings to help make sure that the islands can hold. It gives some links to hold the soil together and uh, the trees a jump start. It creates phenomenal wildlife habitat. I mean, the waterfowl response this past fall and even this spring creates a lot of good subaquatic uh, habitat and also does uh, helps with water uh, quality and clarity, which promotes the subaquatic vegetation. Restoration efforts like the Pool 9 project north of Harper's Ferry occur up and down the Mississippi. Modern conveniences such as dams and bridges, teamed with construction and large-scale agricultural production, have altered the Mississippi ecosystem. From this, the river sees large pools form near the dams, a decrease in bird migration, natural vegetation decreases, and flooding increases due to shallow root systems upstream. So in order for the river to thrive, massive multi-million dollar endeavors are undertaken. You know, people think of rivers as water, which is what they are. And it's, it's easy to think about the fish in the river, but not to think about what are the drivers of those fish habitats and that, and that uh, ecosystem that's there. Historically, there was a lot more forest on the Mississippi River, and, and what it contributes to the overall ecosystem health are things like slowing water when, when the river is flooding, and so that helps to capture sediment and helps to clarify the water. It provides dead wood that actually moves into the river, and, and dead wood is a really important component of, of fish habitat. Uh, it helps prevent erosion. Um, so yeah, there are, there are a wide range of, of ecological values that these trees play, and, and it's really important for the ecosystem as a whole. One major benefit with restoration projects is the ability to improve on nature's design. For instance, the indigenous silver maples that are starting to die off have a lifespan of 80 to 100 years. The replacement trees should live more than twice as long, as well as provide ample sustenance to migrating birds. These swamp white oaks that we're planting here have a lifespan of 250, 200 to 250 years potentially. And the, the swamp white oak that we're planting produces acorns that a lot of wildlife depend on. It also is really interesting because there are certain bird species, the ceruleum warbler, which is a, a species of concern for, for throughout the eastern United States, um, seems to cue in on oak trees specifically. And so where we have more oak, then we tend to have more of those, more of those warblers. And there was actually just recently a study done that showed that hackberry as well is preferentially used by birds migrating up the Mississippi River floodplain. And so, you know, the, the goal is not to create something that's just going to wash, wash away down the river. The goal is to create a system that's going to be sustaining and going to be able to keep itself going. And so with the trees, um, certainly the goal is not just that these trees are going to survive, but that they're going to grow up into mature canopy trees, start producing seed, regenerating on their own, and that this island will hold and maybe even build itself over, over time. With ongoing efforts such as the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program making sure the health of the Mississippi is looked after, an ample supply of area residents willing to volunteer their muscle and time it appears the Mississippi habitat should be around for future generations to revere. You know, the Endangered Species Act was created because, you know, we recognized back in the 70s that, you know, we were doing a lot of changes on the landscape that were causing certain things that people enjoyed and liked to, to decline and, and basically go extinct. And so um, these projects help, you know, either prolong those species from doing that or prevent it to some standard. And, you know, I just think as, a, you know, Aldo Leopold once said, being stewards of the land is what we all should be part of. As the waters of the Mississippi make their way south, the peace of rural life gives way to the loud rush of Dubuque, the first city the Mississippi encounters along Iowa's shore. With a strong history of immigration, mining, agriculture, and abundant land, in the mid-1800s, Dubuque became known as the Key City, 
as in the key to opening the doors of one's dreams. With settlers quickly turning the city into a Midwestern staple for trading, shipping, and industrial work, it's easy to get wrapped up in the works of man and civilization. However, in the heart of the city sits a museum that won't let us forget the importance of the river and its inhabitants. So we're here at the Dubuque Ice Harbor with the Mississippi River Museum, and uh, we're harvesting our cages of infested fish to bring in the mussels that dropped off of them. So these mussels will be used for recovery of rivers as far north as the Chippewa River in Wisconsin, and then as far south as uh, around Guttenberg in Iowa. Freshwater mussels are a major part of both Iowa's history and ecology. And at the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium in Dubuque, visitors have the perfect place to learn about their importance to our state's rivers. To tell you the truth, there's a long, long history of mussels in Iowa. You know, it goes back to, you know, the Native Americans, you know, harvested them, ate them. They used them for tools. They used them for ornaments, you know. So um, then the European cultures, they, they started really looking for pearls. Um, then later, uh, the button industry started. Um, you know, it got replaced by plastic, but for a long time, they were they made the buttons out of the freshwater mussel shells. A lot of people settled in Iowa to, to, to shell, we call it. And, you know, we think possibly they went to a lot of our inland rivers first because the Mississippi was so daunting. A smaller river, they could shell, they could find them pretty easily there. They were shelling in commercially in the Mississippi until about 94, 97, and then that population crashed. Before the button industry took off in the 1800s, 55 different mussel species could be identified in Iowa's rivers. Today, less than 30 can be found, with eight of those listed as in danger of extinction. As conservation efforts work to restore Iowa's mussel populations, the benefits of the animal cannot be overemphasized. First off, mussels are literally filter feeders, meaning they remove sediment and water contaminants that shouldn't be in the ecosystem. But beyond that, mussels are the first element in a thriving river system. These are a keystone species. Some people refer to these as the coral reef of freshwater systems. They literally create a habitat with their body. These animals, as they grow, they are in such mass, in such volume in certain areas that they will cover the entire bottom of the Mississippi River, and they're going to create a physical structure for algae to grow on, algae which then attracts insects, insects, insects that attract fish, some fish even breed on these mussel beds. So as a keystone species, if it was not for this particular animal, that habitat would not exist. And when they are in such mass in those river bottom areas, they're literally holding the bottom of the river in place, preventing erosion from occurring. Another major benefit of mussels is they live a long time and don't travel far, so they are an excellent indicator of the health of a river system. So harvesting these mussels and reintroducing them to area waterways actually helps strengthen the habitat where they are introduced. But even with reintroduction efforts such as this one, restoring mussel populations to sustainable numbers will take much more time and conservation-minded practices. It's a lot easier to keep a species in a system than to have it disappear and then us having to try to reintroduce it. We can keep it in, we can learn these culture techniques, we can use these, these animals in specific projects, but to tell you the truth, I don't know what all the, all the things that mussels do for us. But I can tell you, we'll never know if we lose them. As industries such as button making have come and gone along the Mississippi, the river itself hasn't gone anywhere. Life on the eastern banks of Iowa can depend on, no matter the change, the river will sustain. Barges will continue to push their way down the banks. Riverboats and fishermen will always enjoy what the water has to offer. And flooding will test the resolve of each community built on the mighty Mississippi. One area where habitat and humanity are working together is Muscatine. Formerly known as the pearl capital of the world, it too has evolved with modern times. Home to one of Iowa's most unique habitats, Muscatine's Big Sand Mound Nature Preserve is a great example of modern life learning about natural Iowa from one of its best preserved treasures. Believe it or not, amidst the rush of the Mississippi sits a desert. 
Big Sand Mound is home to a rare variety of flowers, prairie grasses, and animals not found anywhere else. The delicate ecosystem is only open to the public once every three years. During this short window, nature lovers and educators take part in guided field days where tens of thousands of visitors have learned what makes this arid patch of Iowa unique. The mound was built by about 20,000 years ago uh, due to outwash coming from ice sheets to the north and depositing their sand and gravel and silt loads as they went. Uh, after that time period, when the Ice Age ended, there was lots of water from melting surging down the Mississippi River Valley, and it removed a lot of that sediment. And so by about 17,000 years ago, the Big Sand Mound was in place as a unique structure. Um, there were other sand mounds in the area, and there still are other sand fields, but this is one of the biggest single mounds, I believe, uh, remaining really unique to the Midwest, especially to Iowa. This one is very much more like what you would find in the Southwest than you would find in Iowa. You can't create these. So I've done much research on reconstructed, restored, and native uh, prairies and wetlands. The reconstructed and restored ones can have at least some similarity to the real ones in nature. They're not the same. Um, we can't make a fully functioning wetland, uh, the same as we have in nature, or from my, from my viewpoint, same thing with prairies. Owned through a partnership of Mid-American Energy and Monsanto, the mound was considered for the development of a new power plant in the 1970s. However, after an environmental study was completed, researchers discovered endangered species of flora and fauna that won't grow anywhere else, and opportunities for research no other site could offer. It's like a candy store for researchers and for scientists. They're so excited about it. Word spreads around and other scientists want to get in on the action because they know that what they see here is something that they don't see anywhere else in Iowa. To name just a few Big Sand Mound animals found on Iowa's endangered species list, the preserve caters to the western hognose snake, the yellow mud turtle, and the plains pocket mouse. The low moisture and nutrient content of the soil mixed with the hot summers and frigid winters means the area is also home to a list of plants that would never set roots in Iowa without this special ecosystem. We continuously find things here that we didn't know were here or that are only found here or only a large population is found here. It's really enjoyable to just discover things and to see things that you don't normally see. Even with the nature preserve saved from development, the factors of climate change have caused population decline of Big Sand Mound's endangered species and native flora. So in order for the mound to remain special, it will take the efforts of research to keep the mound vibrant for future generations to enjoy. We won't be able to sustain this with our generation. We need the next generation to, to also hold that of high value and to think about how they get involved and how they sustain this. So really, really cool and really exciting to be part of those educational trips. As the Mississippi winds its way toward the southern border of Iowa, Burlington has twisted its way into the record books. Perched on one of the northern hills of downtown, Snake Alley twists and turns 275 feet to the bottom of a hill and into the record books as the crookedest street in the world. Burlington may be Iowa's original capital city, the origin of the term Hawkeye, the birthplace of renowned ecologist and environmentalist Aldo Leopold, and home to the popular natural attraction Star Cave nestled into the bluffs along Flint Creek but Snake Alley's curving cobblestone path has stood as an alluring oddity since 1894, drawing visitors from across the globe to the river town for a quick drive down a zigzagging street. Finally, as Iowa's southern border approaches, the Mississippi River rushes its way past Keokuk. At the southern corner of the state, this is the last chance to appreciate the majesty of the Mississippi and from the heart of downtown Victory Park offers the perfect chance to reflect on everything the river offers. Before the waters bid farewell to Iowa, they passed by bluff formations like nowhere else in the world. They provided habitat for countless animal species on land and in the water. 
They've helped establish cities that made pioneer life possible and helped fuel Midwestern expansion. And over millions of years, they've helped carve absolutely beautiful sites for everyone to enjoy. With the confluence of the Mississippi and the Des Moines rivers, the strong current pushes past Iowa, but not before creating one of the largest watersheds on the planet. Looking back, it's plain to see why the Mississippi is commonly referred to as mighty and why it is a treasure to regard from Iowa's land and sky. Funding for Iowa Land and Sky provided by the Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. The Resource Enhancement and Protection Conservation Education Program.